screen share. Okay. So we touched on this um, <clears throat> the other day and I used um, some of the observations that we had um, from the theory of resolvents to motivate why we might want to consider um, this class of thing, the, the integral equation as opposed to differential equations. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't blame you if this wasn't a particularly convincing argument. I took something abstract and argued that I should be thinking about some other thing that's abstract um, and use the use the first abstract thing to motivate the second abstract thing. Okay, so I, I don't I don't blame you if you don't uh, if you don't entirely buy that argument. <clears throat> so today I want to continue um, and show you that actually there are other reasons why we might want to consider integral equations. Um, you know, to, to start, I have a bit of a confession to make, which is that I love integrals, and I've always loved integrals, kind of from you know from when I was a first year student. I'm trying to see if I have. I'm not sure what you guys used um, when you were um, uh, first year students, but we used we used this book, which was James Stewart's Calculus, and it was back in you know uh, the second edition. I think it's like in its 18th edition now, and this book is this thick, and pretty much you know this much of it is integrals, right? Um, and when I was a first year student, um, at the end of at the end of first year, um, I remember going back um, home and and just sitting down and doing integrals. And I, I think I've so you know in the in the in the year that followed that, once we learned um, multivariable calculus, um, I. I have the dubious distinction of having worked through every single integral in uh, in James Stewart's calculus, the second edition, um, and and I have you know several notebooks full of of those integrals, um, and you know since then I've kind of come to appreciate the idea that integration is really an art form, in the sense that it's this puzzle. And unlike differentiation, where there's a fixed set of rules and you carry out those set of rules and you know that's it, you, you, you do the derivative. Integration is really you versus this integral. And it's a question of you know who's smarter, you or the integral. And 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 so since then, I, I you know I really love integrals. And and I'm not sure if any of you were ever in my second year and third year classes um, in the past, but um, I used to I used to run a competition called this week's integral where I, I would give my class an integral, which almost always could be done if you bring out the big guns, which is complex variable theory. Um, but the point was not to use complex variables um, to solve um, uh, the integral. The point was to try and be as um, as sneaky as you can and, and solve the integral. And of course, the, the most, well, the sneakiest, most elegant solution um, is the one that won the prize. And then you accumulated um, points um, throughout the semester. And at the end of the semester, um, I bought the winner um, of, the, of the competition, the book of their choice. And um, uh, the the I remember the, the the winner of the last competition selected as their book um, the book by Hartson um, algebraic geometry, but you know there's there's a series of books. Um, uh, one is called Irresistible Integrals, um, the other one's called Inside Interesting Integrals, um, and the other one there's another one called um, the uh, mathematical mechanic, um, and they all they all you know it, they all kind of bring out these really cool integrals and look for patterns in how you would solve them. And some some integrals just look completely insurmountable. Like there's no way you can solve this integral. And then and then you you just spot this pattern and it it unravels in this beautiful way. 
Anyway, my rant aside, I love doing integrals. And part of the reason of, you know, of, of, of appreciating integral equations over differential equations is precisely this. You get to take these differential equations and, and view them in completely different ways. So what I want to show you today is why you might want to do that. Um, you know, or even better, how you would take a differential equation and convert it into an integral equation. And what are the pros and cons of doing that? Okay. One of the cons that we'll find is that you don't actually gain anything on the route to solving the differential equation when you formulate it as an integral equation. But one of the pros is that unlike differential equations where you don't just solve a differential equation, right? You solve a differential equation subject to some boundary data. There's a whole course in second year on, on boundary value problems. And that's what it is. It's telling you how the boundary data engages with the differential equation, which is typically an evolution equation for that boundary data. Um, and so um, one of the things that we're going to see in a really neat way here is in integral equations, that boundary data is not some aside that you slip in when you want to get exact, when you want to get specific solutions, right? It's not some additional piece of information that I have to specify when I give you the, the equation. It's actually hard baked into the differential into the integral equation. And what we'll see is that the integral equation itself, the form of the integration uh, of the integral equation changes depending on the boundary conditions that we, uh, or initial conditions that we um, impose on the system. Okay, any questions to start off with? Okay, if not, I want to remind you where we left off last time, which is um, that we, we, just, we said that we could classify integral equations into um, three main types, okay? So each of these three main categories had, you know, two uh, subcategories and depending on the, on the data we were sup supplied with, we would have a different integral equation. So um, either the integral equation has two limits um, or uh, one fixed limit, so two fixed limits, so integral from A to B, or one fixed limit, integral from A to X, where X is a variable. Um, and if it has two limits, then it's called a Friedel equation. If it's got one limit, it's called an uh, integral equation of the Volterra type. The integral equation could be homogeneous or inhomogeneous. And in this case, homogeneous, inhomogeneous means really, do we have a non-vanishing um, uh, right-hand side or not? Um, and then, Finally, if the unknown function that we're trying to solve for um, occurs only on only inside the integral, then it's an integral equation of the first kind. But if it occurs both inside and outside the integral, so it occurs on its own as well as inside an integral, then it's called an integral equation of the second kind. Okay, so we could have something like a homogeneous Volterra equation of the first kind or an inhomogeneous. Uh, Fred Holm equation of the second kind. That's what I mean. So this allows us to classify what types of integral equations we, we're dealing with. So I want to start today by doing an example. And this example will kind of illustrate for us um, the property that I told you about. Then what we'll do is we'll take this example and we'll see what general lessons we learn from it. And then of course, I'll, I'll throw a twist into it to make another point. <clears throat> so, Okay, so let's do the example to start off with. Um, and the example I want to consider here is a very simple first order, sorry, very simple second order um, differential equation. And what we're gonna try and do here is to take that first order, uh, sorry, just to take that second order, sorry. Um, is to take that second order differential equation and try uh, to put it into an integral equation form. Um, so to illustrate what we're going to do, let's consider the following.
So I have some function u of x, and my equation is going to be u double prime, meaning second derivative of u with respect to x, equal to some lambda times potential v of x times this u of x. Okay, and I want to consider this um, subject to the following boundary conditions. The boundary conditions are going to be that u at, I'm going to consider this equation on an interval from zero to L say, and my boundary conditions are gonna be that u of zero and u of L both vanish. So u vanishes on the endpoints. I wanna turn this into um, an integral equation. So the question we would like to ask here is, um, can we turn this into an integral equation? Okay, so I want to start first with the Green's function for this problem. Remember, the Green's function is I take away the right hand side, and I'm going to think of this lambda v of x times u as a source. I take away the right hand side, I replace it with the delta function, possibly with a minus sign, and I keep the boundary conditions that I'm trying to solve the differential equation with respect to. Okay, and the solution of that um, with the right hand side replaced with a delta function. Um, is the Green's function for the problem. So in this case, I'm going to start by solving the Green's function, but you know it's a simple second order differential equation. U double prime equals zero. In this case, it would be G double prime equal to uh, minus delta um, of X. So I know the answer already. Um, start with the Green's function for this problem. In this case, G of x, y is either equal to one over L times x times x, sorry, times x times y minus L, or it's equal to one over L times y times x minus L, depending on whether or not, um, x is, is less than y, both of x and y lie between zero and L. So x zero less than equal to x um, is less than equal to y is less than equal to L. Or y is less than or equal to x. Again, both of them lie between zero and L. Okay, so this is the Green's function for this problem. It's something that you should have calculated before, um, or if you haven't, it's worth just calculating it again on an interval. So that's the key thing here. And the, the point that I was making just now is that um, this satisfies the following equation. It satisfies that, um, d2 by dx squared of g of x y is minus delta of x minus y and subject to the same boundary conditions as u was. So if I think of the right hand side, this lambda v of x u of x um, thing here as the source term for the differential equation, then I can immediately write down a solution for u of x. Um, so in that case, so thinking of lambda v of x u of x as a source, allows us to write down immediately a solution 
u of x equal to, or let's take it on the left-hand side, plus lambda integral from zero to L. Remember both zero and L are the fixed boundaries of the interval that we're considering the differential equation on. Green's function, g of x minus, uh, g of x, y, v of y, u of y, and I'm integrating with respect to y. And all of this is equal to zero. So that's just the green function solution of this differential equation. However, it is an integral equation that the function u must satisfy. So we've converted the differential equation, this differential equation, into an integral equation, okay? Um, it's important to note though, that we haven't actually solved the differential equation. Right? I haven't solved the differential equation. I've just reformulated it as an integral equation. So what have I gained from this if I haven't solved the differential equation? Well, what I've gained in this new formulation is one significant pro, one significant advantage in that in this formulation, the boundary conditions are already baked into the problem. Let's see why. <clears throat> So this is the integral equation formulation. And just while we're while we're here, um, can anybody tell me what type of differential equation of integral equation this is? Come, somebody volunteer. Remember, you get to choose from first kind, second kind, Volterra, Fred Holm, homogeneous, inhomogeneous. It's Fred Holm, homogeneous, second kind. It's homogeneous. The right-hand side is zero. It's of the Fred Holm type because it's got two fixed um, um, limits, and it is of the second kind because the um, the unknown function u occurs both inside and outside the integral. Thank you, Nitin. Everybody see that? Everybody happy with that? Good. So this is a um, Fred Home. Let's do it. It's a homogeneous Fred Home. Um, integral equation of Fred Home type two integral equation. All right. Um, so my claim is that the, Sorry, bro. Um, yeah, uh, I just wanted to ask um, if it if it were to be inhomogeneous, would the function uh, on the right hand side basically just have to be any other function of x? So like h. That's right. It wouldn't contain. It wouldn't contain a u. Right. Okay. Um, so now we're going to note the following. So the question is, what about boundary conditions? Okay. My claim is that this equation already contains the information about the boundaries. All right, so to see why, let's see the following. Um, so at x equal to zero, the left-hand boundary, we note the following. If I stick in x equal to zero into my um, integral equation, I will find that I get u of zero 
plus lambda times the integral from zero to L um, of G of zero Y um, times V of Y times U of Y dy is equal to um, zero. However, I know that my Green's function, right, um, <clears throat> satisfies the same different, satisfies the same boundary conditions as um, the function itself. And so it must vanish at, um, at x equal to zero, which means that this thing is not giving me any contributions. And this whole term is equal to zero, which means that automatically u at zero is equal to zero. And similarly, you can show that uh, at x equals l, um, u will vanish as well. So you might argue, well, okay, that's a bit of a stretch, right? Because I built this integral equation from the from the Green's function. I started with the Green's function. And the Green's function, by definition, satisfies the same boundary condition. So obviously, if I if the Green's function is going to show up in my integral equation, then, okay, the boundary condition is already hard-baked into this thing. But these are the boundary conditions for you, right? And this is actually a specific case of a more general statement. But can everybody see this, um, in this case at least? Yeah? Anyone? Good. All right. So this is actually a specific case of a more general uh, statement. So let's consider more generally then the second order ordinary differential equation. So more generally, um, let's see how we convert the second order ODE um, let's say Y double prime. Yeah, let's say Y double prime plus A of X Y prime. So I've got some X dependent coefficient of, um, of Y plus B of X Y equal to some inhomogeneous part, which I'm gonna call G of X. Right. And I want to consider this subject to initial conditions. That y at, let's say, a equal to y naught and um, say y prime at a, I'm going to call y naught prime. Is everybody with me? Okay, so that's my system. That's what I want to consider. Um, yeah, it's a fairly straightforward um, second order linear differential equation, which you would have seen already in first year. Because I'm particularly deep when it comes to solving this thing, and I can solve it by many ways. I can solve it by integrating factor. Um, I can solve it by factorization, um, etc. Okay, so that the, again, the point is not the solution of the differential equation. The point is the reformulation of the differential equation as an integral equation. So in order to do that, Let's start by integrating once. 
So if I integrate this equation once, I get the following. I'll find that um, y prime of x is equal to minus the integral, in fact, let's put it in another line, y prime of x is equal to minus the integral from a to x of this a of t, t here is a, is a dummy variable in the integration, y prime of t dt minus the integral from a to x of b of t, y of t, um, dt, plus the integral from a to x, g of t, dt. And then what I did on the left-hand side was an integral from a to x of uh, y double prime. Um, and so I will pick up two terms. The first term I've already kept on the left, that's the y prime of x. The second term is a term that will go like minus uh, y prime at a, and y prime at a is what we call y naught prime. Everybody with me? I haven't done anything particularly deep, I've just done one integration here. Um, now what I'll do is I'll, I'll integrate the first term by parts. And that'll throw the derivative um, onto the a um, factor, but it will also give me a boundary term, which I have to account for. So I'm going to integrate by parts, which will take it and then put it into the following form. So if I do that, I'll find that um, this is minus the integral, sorry, this is minus a of t, uh, sorry, a of x, y of x, um, minus the integral from a to x, b of t, minus a prime of t, that's the term that came from the integration by parts, y of t. Now you see why I've done that because I can pull out a common factor of y and group two terms together, dt, plus an integral from a to x of g of t, dt, plus a at a, y at a, which I was calling y naught, plus y naught prime, which I'm carrying up, uh, carrying down from the previous step, okay? So that's the boundary term. So these two, these two here are the boundary terms, this one and this one. Um, and this minus sign came from here. And then this term, this term was already there. This term came from the integration by parts. This term I just brought down, and this term I just brought down, okay? So that was easy enough. So now let's do it one more time. So if I integrate a second time, I will find that I get y of x. And this is equal to <clears throat> minus the integral from a to x of a of t, y of t, dt, minus the integral from a to x of the integral from, let's say, a to u, 
of b of t minus a prime of t y of t dt du plus the integral from a to x, and running out of space here, plus the integral from a to x of uh, the, the integral from a to u, g of t, sorry, <laughs> g of t, dt, du. Finally, the boundary terms a y naught plus y naught prime. And then these are constants. So this just pulls out a factor of x minus a. And then there's an additional boundary term that comes from the second integral on the left-hand side, which contributes a y naught. Okay. All right. Okay, now I want you to do an exercise and I'm gonna use the outcome of this exercise in what follows. This is an exercise in first year integrals. Maybe not first year integrals, but certainly it should be first year integrals. Integral from A to X, give you an instruction and that instruction is to show that the integral from a to x of the integral from a to u for a general function f of t dt du is equal to the integral, sorry, yeah, from a to x, x minus t, f of t, dt, okay? So if I have an iterated integral like the one on the left-hand side, um, then I can shuffle the integration order around and show that if I integrate with respect to u first, then I'll pull out this x minus t term, and this is just the integral from a to x, x minus t f of t dt, okay? So I'm gonna use that result now. So using that result, it then follows that, um, y of x, is equal to uh, minus the integral of uh, minus the integral from a to x of a of t plus x minus t, and that factor is coming from that integral I just asked you to do, um, times b of t minus a prime of t all of this times y of t and then i have to integrate with respect to t plus an integral from a to x of x minus t g of t dt plus um, a of a y naught plus y prime naught 
all of this multiplying x minus a, this term we did already, plus the final y naught. Great. So now I want to make some definitions. In particular, I'm going to define um, the following. I'm going to define what I'm going to call k of x and t. And k of x and t is going to be defined to be t minus x times b of t minus a prime of t minus an overall a of t. Okay. So you can see it's just minus the thing in the curly brackets in the first term. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to define a new function, which I'm going to call f of x. <coughs> and f of x is going to be all of the remaining stuff. So it's integral from a to x, x minus t, g, t dt plus a of a y naught plus y naught prime times x minus a plus y naught. Okay. The key point about all of this stuff is that it doesn't involve um, uh, y at all. There's no y sitting in, in, in these terms. So we're just going to group everything. The only variable in this problem is going to be x. So it's going to be some function of x. But what that allows me to do is to put my y now into the following form, having integrated twice the original differential equation that I started off with. It just says that y of x is f of x plus the integral from a to x of this k of x and t times y of t dt. And that's the formulation that we want for a general second order linear differential equation into an integral equation form. Somebody tell me what type of integral equation this is, please. Cabello? Okay, um, it's a second type in homogeneous um, Fredenholm equi integral equation. So two out of three. <laughs> Which one is wrong? Is it of the Volterra type? It is of the Volterra type. Good. So this is a uh, inhomogeneous. Type two, Volterra equation. Good. Is everybody happy with that? Good. So I want to do one more example. Um, I want to do one more example to just solidify this. Um, and then I'm going to talk about what happens if we change um, boundary conditions in that example. But uh, for the moment, I wanna just do this one example, um, just to make sure that we all understand. This is my favorite example, which is the harmonic oscillator. So let's try and find an integral equation for the harmonic oscillator.
Right, so we want to try and formulate the harmonic oscillator, which is the equation y double prime plus omega squared y equal to zero. Um, with um, initial conditions. Y of naught equal to naught and Y prime of naught, so initial position um, zero and initial velocity is going to be one in whatever units we're picking here. Okay. So this clearly falls into the same class of problems that we've just been considering with A of X equal to zero, B of X equal to omega squared, and G of X equal to zero. So if I substitute, um, if I substitute into the y of x we've just written down, working out what the f of x and um, and uh, uh, k of x and t is. By the way, I need to mention that this thing here, very importantly, is called the integral kernel. Remember that. Then I find that y of x is equal to um, x plus omega squared integral from zero to x of t minus x uh, y of t. Dt. Again, it is a inhomogeneous Volterra equation of the second kind. Okay, but you know we shouldn't expect anything different, of course, because this is this is the harmonic oscillator is just a special case of the linear differential uh, differential uh, equation that we um, considered. Um, one important point here is that the kinds of boundary conditions that are baked into this particular um, problem are in fact um, the initial conditions. Okay, so as a as a in order to make a point, let's ask what happens if you change. The, bar, the conditions, right? You can certainly change the conditions from initial conditions to, um, to oh goodness, I ran out of paper. Um, uh, let me just make some more paper quickly. So one could ask, what happens if I change the initial conditions to, let's say, boundary conditions? So I replace the initial conditions that I consider with um, Dirichlet conditions. What would I expect to happen? Well, in the case of differential equations, what would happen is nothing really. You'd basically you basically start off with the differential equation, um, and all you would do is you would change the, uh, the, the data, right? You would resupply a new set of, uh, of, of data. In this case, because I said that the form, the actual form of the integral equation um, is different depending on 
whether I have um, Dirichlet boundary conditions, Neumann boundary conditions, initial valued conditions, um, I get different differential equations. And this is what I want to show you now. But first, I would like you to do a simple exercise for me, and that's to check. So let's try that again. Exercise. Check that um, y of x for this problem that we're solving for those initial conditions is solved by sine omega x times one over w, okay? Okay, so then let's ask, what if the boundary conditions change? Well, um, suppose we want to solve this problem with Neumann boundary conditions. Oh, sorry, with Dirichlet boundary conditions. So suppose instead of the initial conditions that we considered, that I have instead y at zero equal to y at, let's say, b, and um, this is equal to 0. So I'm trying to solve the problem now on an interval from 0 to b, and I set my, um, my boundary conditions at uh, that everything must vanish at the boundaries, OK? Well, in this case, I don't know what y prime of naught is. And so I need to modify the calculation that we just did a little bit to incorporate this, right? I'm gonna write down just the first integral and then I'm going to, um, uh, in fact, let's, let's, we can do both integrations. So now if we integrate, we find two things, that y prime is equal to minus omega squared times the integral from zero to x, y of t, tt, plus y prime of naught. And then if I integrate one more time, then I'll find that y of x is equal to minus omega squared times the integral from zero to x um, of y of t dt plus y prime of naught. But I don't know what this y prime of naught is, and that's gonna be my job. So I'm gonna leave it, sorry, uh, plus x times y prime of naught. Yeah, so I'm going to leave the calculation here and we're going to pick up uh, next time and I'm going to show you that it actually gives me a different um, type of equation. In fact, where I had a Volterra equation with initial conditions when, with boundary conditions, um, I'm going to get a Fredholm equation. Okay, so let's leave it at there because it's going to take a little bit of time. So. Any questions? Um, I do have one question, but it might be because I, I wasn't paying attention at some point. Um, mm -hmm. When we were sort of deriving the most general form of the uh, solution to uh, second order 
in homogeneous differential equation. Yeah. Um, there's a point where we introduce boundary terms. Um, and I wanted to know if we, if we ended up ever resolving them. What do you mean introduce boundary terms? Um, when we do the integration by parts, the, the first time on the A of T times Y prime of T. Yeah. Yes, up there. Yeah. Uh, we introduce boundary terms. Um, uh -huh. Does that not uh, change things? Or do, do um, what I'm saying is, do we need boundary conditions to resolve that? I need boundary conditions on Y to, to, to carry those. No, I, okay, it's not a question of resolving it. I mean, they're here. I take them along for the ride. They're these guys. They just keep following into the into the into the formulation okay right cool all right um thanks guys